Welcome to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Stocks plunge amidst a resurgence in cases of COVID-19 across the country, falling to their lowest levels in more than two weeks. Facebook shares dropping to their lowest point since March as more and more advertisers start to boycott the service. This is various states halt the reopening of their economies. Texas and Florida making additional closures today. Apple has already shut a number of stores across the country. Microsoft shutting all of its retail stores today. Joining us now to break it all down, our Bloomberg Markets reporter, Abigail Doolittle, who's been following all the action. Abigail, a rough day for stocks. This virus news really starting to weigh on investors. What did you see? Rough day indeed. Stock sharply lower and the selling pressure never really relented. Finally, Emily, we have stocks responding to data as it comes out with the big drop on this worsening data here in the U.S. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100, both down about two and a half percent. That FANG index taking a bigger hit, of course, on uh, Facebook. Confirming the risk off sense uh, was the fact that bonds, Haven bonds, rallied once again. So when you have a cross asset class confirmation and we were to bring oil into that picture, investors want out of risk. And today, this week even, uh, they're really not tiptoeing. They're running out of some of these uh, risk assets on fears, Emily, that perhaps the virus, as we've been talking about it, more likely this is still uh, the first wave, just uh, additional spikes in these new states and hotspots, fears that that could really hurt the U.S. economy. Uh, meantime, you've been talking about havens rising as stocks have been down. What would you point out there? So that has been continuing. So it feels as though this week is new in terms of this risk off sense because we had the big down day on Wednesday, the big down day today, and it's lining up with this negative data on the virus. So it makes sense. But this dynamic really started about three weeks ago when the virus data started to weaken. Uh, uh, the week of uh, June 12th. At that point, we had the yen rallying, we had bonds rallying, stocks down, uh, and oil starting uh, a downtrend. Trend shifts, Emily, are so subtle to detect, but from a cross asset class standpoint, right now, this may make the case that we could be moving toward a period of risk off. If we continue to see uh, stocks and oil and some of the other risk assets down next week while the havens are up, again, it could really make the point that stocks will finally do something uh, that they've done in every other other uh, bearish period, which is test the low. That happened in 2008. It happened uh, in 1987 and certainly happened in the 1930s, probably other time periods as well. It has not happened yet, but perhaps it will as these virus fears again are renewed in the U.S. Meantime, Facebook shares plunging as more and more advertisers pull out of the platform and join this ongoing boycott, including Unilever today, Procter & Gamble, also initiating a comprehensive review of the platforms that it advertises on. Uh, not a good day for Facebook shares. Not a good day at all. And to put the sell-off into perspective on the day, Emily, this was the worst day since March 16th. So going back to that horrible bear market selling pressure back in March, that's the type of selling pressure we saw today in Facebook on the week, down 9.5%. You know that I like to look at charts. The technicals for this stock, ugly. Today, it absolutely went from being near a record high to plunging below its 50-day moving average. That is a, a fancy way of saying that the floor simply fell out. Buyers absolutely disappeared. And there's reasons to think that we could actually, the shares of Facebook could continue to plunge, probably on the fears that maybe some other big advertisers uh, would pull away. If this were to happen with Facebook, it could set off a negative round of sentiment around some of those other FANG stocks, uh, that FANG index again down more than the other major averages. This would be an additional pressure uh, relative, uh, in addition, I should say, to the virus. Uh, that could really be a negative for the market. So next week could be an interesting one. Even though it's a holiday shortened one, that could be uh, the the one bright spot for stocks next week that a lot of folks will be uh, even more so on vacation than they are working it from home, Emily. All right, Abigail, thank you so much for that update. We'll be watching if Facebook shares continue to stay under pressure as more advertisers join this boycott, which also, of course, includes a boycott of Instagram. We now know Unilever, Verizon, Patagonia, just some of the companies joining the Stop Hate for Profit campaign that's been organized in part by the Anti-Defamation League. The ADL is among a number of civil rights groups unhappy with how Facebook is moderating its content and uh, what they say is a long history of allowing posts that encourage voter suppression, among other things. Joining our, us right now is the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenbatch. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. So talk thank to you, us Emily. about what you're hearing from advertisers at this very moment as your campaign is picking up steam. Sure. 
So Stop Hate for Profit is a long-term advocacy campaign organized by ADL, the NAACP, Color of Change, and a bunch of other civil rights groups, as you said, specifically to tackle the problem of hate online. And we focused on Facebook because they are the largest social network in the world and the biggest advertising platform on the planet. And what's so interesting is, as we made this call, so to do a better job of fighting racism and pushing back against hate, our phones have been ringing off the hook with advertisers. So you mentioned Verizon and Unilever, Ben & Jerry's, Patagonia. There's also North Face. Honda joined this afternoon. Birchbox joined this afternoon. And I can tell you, more are coming. Advertisers who have seen their own ads published against hateful, horrible content on Facebook, racist, anti-Semitic poison, they are finally saying, enough. What is it that you think Facebook is doing wrong? What are the real, I mean, there are a number of issues. What are the main issues in your mind? Well, for years, we and others have called on Facebook to change, and they haven't. I mean, they've really, they've really prioritized profits and reach over uh, people and the safety of their users. So there are several very specific, clear things we want them to do. First, we want them to be accountable. They should be providing audits and refunds to advertisers who ads are shown next to content that was removed because it violated the terms of service. They should submit to regular third-party independent audits of how they're dealing with hate on the platform. Self-reporting isn't very useful when the author has a vested interest in what they're sharing. We want them to focus on the safety of their users, right? Remove public and private groups focused on white supremacy and anti-Semitism and racism and violent conspiracies. And when people are harassed on Facebook, there should be a mechanism to give them the support that they need, like every other business does. So this is indeed about accountability. It's about transparency. It's about safety. And ultimately, it's about leadership. We want Facebook to establish, again, at a leadership level, a civil rights infrastructure that would evaluate their products and policies for discrimination, bias, and hate. It isn't too much to ask for a company that earned $70 billion in revenue to invest a little more in making sure that all people, regardless of how they pray or what they look like or who they're from, everyone should be fairly protected when they use the platform. Now, speaking of leadership, Mark Zuckerberg did hold a town hall earlier today talking about how they are responding. They're adding some new features. They're going to be directing users to their voter information center on any posts, including those of politicians, a.k.a. those of President Trump, uh, that talk about voting. Facebook also saying they're going to prohibit ads that paint anyone of a certain race, gender, or sexual orientation as da dangerous. And, and Zuckerberg sounded fairly upbeat in, in talking about what he believes is their ability to address this controversy. Take a listen to part of what he had to say. I am optimistic that we're going to be able to make progress on, on, on these challenges. On, um, we're going to be able to make progress on public health. Uh, I think we're going to be able to make pro uh, progress on racial justice. And I think we're going to be able to do that while maintaining our democratic traditions uh, around free expression and voting. And I'm committed uh, to making sure that Facebook is a force for good on this journey. What's your reaction, Jonathan, to that and some of the changes that Facebook is making? Well, look, faced with this tidal wave, uh, Zuck responds today with a small number of changes. And I mean, first, to say that they would apply their hate policy to ads as if that was some new revelation while not addressing hate more broadly, hate in groups, hate in posts. I mean, I just don't get it. It seems like Mark really doesn't understand the problem. The problem isn't that Verizon and Salesforce and P&G are pushing hateful ads. The problem is that their, ha their ads are subsidizing hateful content. And voter misinformation, look, that may be a bit harder to spread the day of the election. That's good. But does that mean that voter misinformation will run rampant the rest of the time? And the idea that posts that call for violence will still be allowed if they come from someone, quote, newsworthy? But none of that will be vetted or verified. Look, I don't think it makes a dent in the problem, Emily. And it tells me that we still have a long way to go. But make no mistake, 
what you heard from uh, Mark Pritchard from P&G the other day, what you've now heard from Viber, Eileen Fisher, Mozilla, Dashlane, so many, again, Honda, Unilever, Verizon, so many of these companies are saying, we don't want to advertise on a platform that undermines our values. And that, I think, is the real story here until Facebook will take meaningful steps and make real changes that reflect the shared values, not just of those brands, but I think of the general public in our society, I don't think we're, we're going to be in the right place. Now, you've built quite a coalition around this, Jonathan. You've got the NAACP, Color of Change, uh, on board, uh, along with various groups representing underrepresented minorities. Why does this mm -hmm. issue matter to so many different kinds of people, not just African Americans, not just immigrants? Well, look, I mean, this is an issue that affects all of us. I mean, we're living in a time now where hate crimes have been indisputably on the rise. You don't just have to believe me at the ADL. You can see the FBI's data. We're living in a time right now when attacks on people who are, you know, Latino, uh, attacks on people who are Jewish, attacks on people who are Muslim, these things are all up. Last year, the ADL tracked more anti-Semitic incidents than we've seen in our 40-year history of doing that work. So the reason why so many groups are concerned is because immigrants are indeed under siege, because our president can't seem to refer to the COVID-19 as anything other than the China virus or the Chinese flu or even more offensive things when Asian Americans are being harassed in the streets by, by people. And again, the issues with George Floyd really laid bare, watching him die on the street laid bare, and we've had this public recting on issues of systemic racism, which have always been there. And yet, over the past few weeks, Emily, at ADL, because we have a center in Silicon Valley, we are working with the companies, we are monitoring these issues, and we saw white nationalists right. literally organizing on Facebook to disrupt those protests. We saw extremists coordinating their efforts to spread conspiracy theories and to ultimately show up and, again, try to undermine and disrupt these peaceful gatherings. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I don't think any traditional media would allow that. I don't think any normal company would allow that. And it's long overdue for Facebook to say we will not allow that. A social crisis in the midst of a health crisis and an economic crisis. Jonathan Greenblatt, head of the Anti-Defamation League, thank you so much for joining us. All right, coming up, the Sun Belt states and other states across the South pulling back on the reopening of their economies as cases of COVID-19 surge across the country. We'll, we'll look at how children are being impacted by this with the CEO of Boston's Children's Hospital next. This is Bloomberg. LeBron James and Maverick Carter are boyhood friends turned business partners, but the ground under James and Carter's project has shifted, with a pandemic putting the NBA season on hold and protests forcing America to confront issues of racial injustice. I spoke with LeBron James and Maverick Carter in February, and in June I connected with them again in their first interview since the world locked down due to COVID-19 to get their thoughts on what's been taking place in the streets. Join us for a special Bloomberg Business Week, a conversation with LeBron James and Maverick Carter, Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Television. Cases of COVID-19 topping 9.6 million around the world in the U.S. Outbreaks flaring up in Texas, Florida, and California, Texas and Florida, halting drinking at bars. And as the pandemic worsens for some, it is getting better in other states. New Jersey has seen over 12,000 deaths and is in the midst of slowly opening back up. Today, its governor announced school will reopen in the fall, but with restrictions subject to change. But overall, children not faring the worst uh, of the infected, but uh, there are other ways that they are being impacted. Joining us now is Sandra Fenwick, the CEO of Boston Children's Hospital, which is the number one pediatric hospital, according to U.S. News and World Report. Sandra, thank you so much for joining us. So obviously, children aren't as seriously impacted by the virus. From a health perspective, what have uh, the cases of COVID-19 among children looked like to you? What have you been seeing at your hospital? We have seen uh, a, a number of children come through, both with the virus 
but also with this new uh, syndrome, the multi and uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. We've seen about 150 children with positive COVID. Most of them have had a relatively mild form of the disease, and uh, uh, several of them have had more, more need for intensive care, but they've mostly been children with underlying disease. Uh, the more sick children are the ones with this new syndrome, and we've seen just over 30 of them uh, in the last couple of weeks. So that has been our experience, but we've been preparing um, for the same kind of situation that even all the adult hospitals had to as well. So that certainly counters the point that some have tried to make that children are, quote unquote, basically immune to this virus. I mean, how concerned should we be about our children out there? Well, children, you know, have been testing positive. Many of them have tested positive and are um, are not symptomatic. So they, they, the question is whether they are really um, also transmitters of the disease, even though they're not showing symptoms. And so that's something that we're still attempting to study to truly understand why this virus, unlike other flus, have not necessarily had the same degree of impact uh, on children. And that's still a bit of a mystery and therefore a lot of research that's going to go on to understand that. One of your doctors is leading the overcoming COVID-19 study and the impact that it has on children in particular. What are they looking at in that particular study? So this is a national study uh, looking to enroll a thousand patients who have tested positive and um, to uh, over 70 hospitals. Because we've had few cases in each hospital, we're going to have to spread uh, the intake of these patients over many hospitals. We are about 20% of the way in. And Dr. Adrian Randolph here at Boston Children's is the lead investigator on this very large CDC study. And they're going to be trying to understand all of those questions. Um, why are children less impacted by this? Which children are more impacted? What is this new syndrome? And why is it showing up weeks after uh, the child has been exposed to COVID? Um, what is the immune, immune response uh, that children have that perhaps adults do not have? Uh, who is protected? What happens to a child uh, when they have an underlying either immune or other chronic disease? And so many, many, many questions are going to be a part of this study. Meantime, you've got schools closed, camps not happening. I imagine this is having a mental and emotional impact on children as well, even if they're not getting sick. Are you seeing cases of this impacting children's, you know, sort of mental and emotional and behavioral health? Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is one of the concerns um, as this pandemic continues because children have not been in their normal routines, whether in childcare centers, in schools, uh, they've been socially distanced, they have been um, uh, impacted by stress in the home where parents are either at home and trying to work or they've lost jobs. There are uh, children, particularly in the inner city, who are hungry because many of them were getting uh, their meals at school and they're not getting them at school. Um, there are parents who are struggling to meet their rent and I think we're going to see an increase in the amount of homelessness. All of these issues are going to have a significant impact on the children's mental and behavioral health. And so this is another thing that we need to begin to understand much more deeply uh, to really study our children uh, impacted more behaviorally and, and if they have even underlying mental health conditions? And if so, how do we prepare this, the childcare centers, the schools, families, uh, physicians to both recognize this and how to handle it when these children start coming back into these settings? So as a parent, wondering if schools are going to reopen and wondering if they do reopen, should I send my children, given that there are Obviously, the health concerns, the uncertainties around whether children actually transmit the virus if they're asymptomatic, but also these emotional behavioral issues, concerns around, you know, my, my child losing, uh, you know, several months of, of their education. Do you think schools should reopen or not? And if they do reopen, should parents send them? Absolutely. First and foremost, you know, I think they need the social interaction. They need routines. Um, they are hungry um, for 
wanting to be in those kinds of settings, um, both for the learning, some of them are really missing that, um, and for the other, the play that occurs, um, the interactions, the potential sports, uh, just the, the connections that they're making. They miss their teachers. Um, we have a daycare center here at Children's and we just opened this week and it they've been trying to do things remotely with remote learning and, and virtual learning and it has been very difficult. How do you do playtime with a bunch of three-year-olds? Um, how do you do real learning with children in, in elementary school? And so we believe that it is very important to try and find a way to safely bring these children back. Clearly, we'll have to figure out ways to think about um, personal protective equipment with, with masks, uh, intense cleaning, uh, social distancing, not allowing the kids that much human and you know touching interaction. But we believe opening those are going to be good for family life, for parents to be able to go back to work when they need to, as well as for the children. So given the resurgence of cases across the country, how concerned are you about that and what is the hospital preparing for? Well, we've learned a lot, um, obviously, from this first round, uh, more than we ever really wanted to, I think. Um, but we know now how to test. We know how to treat. We've had to set, set up so many different uh, ways of, of uh, bringing our, our patients in safely how to keep our staff safe. And so there are many things that will probably be in place now in, in some respects for forever. Um, if we can get through this, um, uh, this round, the, the real concern is the flu season. And so we are going to double down uh, and really encourage, and this is something I wanna make sure we say over and over again, uh, we need to have everyone get their flu shots uh, come this fall because a layering on of COVID right and flu is going to be really problematic. Flu in children is far more okay. severe than clearly this COVID. So I would just uh, recommend that everyone think about this very carefully and uh, ensure that we're still going to hospitals when we need to, getting preventive care, taking medication, and making sure if symptoms increase that people get health care. Okay. Point taken. Um, thank you so much. CEO of Boston Children's Hospital, Sandra Fenwick, thank you so much for joining us. All right, I do want to get to some breaking news now, which is that Apple is being further scrutinized in a probe by the U.S. Department of Justice. Our Mark Gurman just broke the story and joins us now on the phone. Mark, what do we know? So what we know is that Apple has been one of the main tech players under a U.S. antitrust investigation by the Department of Justice for about a year now. And we know that app developers, both big and small, have both been continuing to meet the Justice Department. Uh, as of last week, at least two developers that we spoke to met with the DOJ. Uh, the DOJ has more recently been asking questions specifically about the App Store rules related to app subscriptions and in-app purchases. And so we know that that is one of their current focus areas, and the inquiry about Apple is limited to the App Store. We also know that the Apple inquiry is in a much, much earlier stage than the Google inquiry. Uh, we know that both the DOJ and the app developers have reached out to each other. So it's not necessarily the DOJ starting with the questions. Sometimes it could be app developers coming to them, but it's also vice versa. And we know that the majority of the resources in the DOJ's antitrust division right now are still focused on Google. And it's unclear if there will be a formal case brought against Apple and they're still in the investigation stage. Okay, Mark Gurman there. Uh, with that quick update, thank you so much, Mark. Uh, we'll continue to follow that story, that one just out from Mark Gurman. Okay, coming up, he is leading the largest black-led venture capital fund in the world. We're going to hear from the co-founder of Base 10 Partners, Adeyemi Ajao, with us next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. The world's largest black-led venture capital fund just got 
bigger. Base 10 Partners says today it's raised $250 million in a second fund uh, to fund startups and various other initiatives aimed at diversifying a predominantly white tech industry. I spoke to Adeyemi Ajao, the co-founder of Base 10 Partners, about that and his efforts to fight racial injustice. We are very thankful for the amount of confidence that has been put on us by our LPs and our founders. Uh, my partner T and I and the entire team, uh, we feel that we are at a special time and in a privileged position because we are a um, minority-led organization, um, but we're not necessarily minority-focused by mandate. We just happen to believe that uh, uh, investing in big problems means investing in people that represent the diversity of all of society. Um, and we want to do more on that. And with this fund, we feel we have the responsibility to do even more on that. We've been seeing, obviously, incredible momentum behind the Black Lives Matter movement. And I wonder how you have been experiencing that and whether it's impacting your strategy in terms of where to put this money. Yeah, um, we are very happy to see the traction that that movement is having. Um, we think that investing in diversity is just good business. We have always thought so. We set up base 10 with one and two investing problems for the 99%. And again, we believe that means that the founders should represent the racial diversity and other diversity of that 99%. Um, what we think now is that in technology, we have a collective responsibility to actually make that happen, to remove the biases that we all naturally have. Um, and our commitment as an organization is both to invest even more time in that, um, to find those founders that are out there and that are wonderful. And um, by the way, if they are being overlooked, that is even better business because you find them before everyone else. Um, and beyond that, as an organization, we also decided to announce a formal uh, monetary and type commitment uh, to support racial diversity movements because we think that, you know, if not at this time, when is the right time to take a step forward? What's it been like raising money in Silicon Valley as a black investor? I mean, have you run into instances of unintended racism? Um, I would say that my experience has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, we are a very different and diverse team. Um, Black Hispanic, my co-founder TJ is white and half Armenian. Our partner Reggie is Albanian and came to the US as a refugee. Uh, Chris has a very diverse background, et cetera. Um, and I think what the LP community feedback to us has been is actually positive, that by being a diverse team, uh, we might be able to empathize with a larger array of founder backgrounds. Um, and in particular, we think it's, it's good to invest in the underdog um, and by being a little bit the outsider, uh, it's maybe easier to find that underdog and empathize with them. It's not necessarily that experience uh, for black entrepreneurs. We spoke to the CEO of Lucidworks, Will Hayes, who told us investors, when he walks into a room, they expect him to be white. And how do we change that? As a former entrepreneur, um, I have also experienced that. Um, and, and I've experienced many different instances of that. Um, and I know that most of them come from a good place. Um, what we believe is that it's very important for all of us to be able to have an open conversation and realize that we all have these biases. We are literally programmed with them. Um, and we believe that if something great can come out of this time, it's actually the ability to put that out there and be like, hey, we're all biased and we might be like undervaluing certain people just by the fact that they don't look like the current Fortune 100 CEOs. Uh, so how do we change that? Because we're actually leaving value on the table by not assessing those people correctly. Meantime, you know, you're also an immigrant. And this week, the president suspended guest worker visas. And you've got the immigrant community feeling very alienated right now. Um, What's your reaction to that as, you know, not just a, a black, but also an immigrant investor? Um, we, we believe that it's tragic. Um, we believe um, as a team that, you know, one, it's a human tragedy and we are all personally touched by a number of people that are in a difficult position because of that decision. Um, but moreover, you know, as a country, if there was ever a time to like work together on how automation and technology can help us move forward when a lot of the 
things that had us together actually you know are distancing us um, is now uh, and we need all the help we can get from everywhere in the world uh, to do that together and restricting that is just hurtful uh, for the society for the economy and for everyone so let's talk about where you plan to put this money to work we are in the middle of a pandemic an economic crisis a social crisis, where do you see the biggest opportunity to make returns on new technology? So we, our overarching thesis is automation for a real economy, big, large school industries that need automation to move forward. Real estate, construction, uh, food logistics, retail, etc. cetera. Um, it has been really humbling um, and, and very fulfilling during the pandemic to see some of our portfolio companies working with restaurants, um, with retail businesses, um, with stay-at-home entrepreneurs, uh, with farmers uh, that have literally actually wrote us and tell us, hey, thank you for your portfolio company, Pop Menu or The Pill Club uh, or Wise. They have helped me stay in business during the pandemic. Um, so we believe that this time actually uh, make us want to double down in all those industries. Um, make us want to find those entrepreneurs, ideally that come from those industries, that they understand just how dire some of the situations are like for restaurants in America right now, um, and have the tools to help them not only survive, but thrive through this. As you mentioned, you, you're, a, you're a former entrepreneur, you co-founded the Spanish version of Facebook 20, and also a company called Identified AI for HR, which was bought by Workday, how do you expect uh, the tech industry and the startup economy to come out of this pandemic? We've seen a lot of layoffs. We know that a lot of companies won't survive this. What does that mean on the other side? Um, it's a great question. And I think we none of us have a perfect answer. Um, we, it's, it's a time in which I am particularly worried about the real economy. Uh, I'm particularly worried about the uh, small and medium businesses. Um, and I think that the technology industry that maybe has an easier time adapting uh, to some of these things because we're used to remote tools or we're used to the digital. Um, if, if, if we're somewhat in a better position, uh, we definitely have a collective responsibility to figure out, okay, how do we help the real economy? How do we work with all of these small and medium businesses? Because by the way, if we get that right, that is a fantastic economic opportunity for everyone, but it's also the right thing to do. Ariami Ajao there, co-founder and managing partner of Base 10 Partners. Meantime, in some acquisition news today, Amazon is buying the self-driving vehicle startup Zooks. Terms of the deal haven't been disclosed, but one report puts the price at $1 billion to bring in, to discuss, let's bring in Bloomberg's Matt Day, who covers Amazon. So Matt, why is Amazon buying a self-driving car company? So first and foremost, we know they were for sale, uh, really seeking a partner, and, and Amazon is a very opportunistic uh, M&A strategy, but we also around particularly in autonomous vehicles. It's one of the sort of biggest uh, spaces that they've been active in, kind of on the margins, but don't have a, a flagship uh, play in, and that obviously changes with the acquisition of uh, Zooks. Meantime, you've got Elon Musk tweeting, Jeff Bezos is a copycat. Ha ha. Uh, any reaction to that? Oh, he, he, none from uh, from Mr. Bezos officially so far. Uh, Elon certainly likes to, to needle the Amazon CEO. This is the second time he's done this in, in recent months. Um, he was also, you know, suggested kind of casually that Amazon should be broken up in a, in a Twitter conversation. So definitely uh, no love lost on Twitter between these two. So how do you expect Amazon to potentially integrate self-driving technology into its operations? So in, in a bit of surprise, the company has said today that their aim is for self-driving technology, you know, developed by Zooks to be a ride-hailing application um, first and foremost, which surprised a lot of folks who, you know, would expect over time if, if this works that Amazon would, would certainly want to bring this to bear in, in their delivery operations. They've been investing heavily in transportation kind of of all stripes to get packages uh, around the, the world. And I think the expectation, if they have success in this ride hailing application, potentially you'd see this uh, migrate over to logistics as well. 
All right, a story we'll continue to follow, and the tweets as well. Of course, Bloomberg's Matt Day, thanks so much. All right, coming up, need a gift idea for your special someone in quarantine? Well, there's an app for that. We're gonna talk to the CEO of Cameo, which allows you to send private messages from your favorite athletes and celebrities around the world. Even my husband, who needed a last minute idea on Mother's Day, sent me a Cameo from one of my, I'll admit, favorite reality TV stars, Barb, Peter's mom on The Bachelor. Hey, Emily, how are you doing? This is Barb from The Bachelor. I wanted to let you know that Jonathan reached out to me to tell me a little bit about you. You are a big fan. Oh my goodness, well, thank you so much. I appreciate that and that, you know, the fact that you loved Peter and that you would protect your sons and daughters the way that I did, of course we would, you know? That's what moms are for. When cities began to order people to shelter in place in March, just about all in-person engagements went dark. That is when Cameo, an app for personal video shoutouts from celebrities, took off. Founded in 2016, Cameo has enrolled thousands of movie, music, and TV stars, as well as influencers like Snoop Dogg and, as we just saw, the cast of The Bachelor to its talent list. Joining us to discuss Cameo co-founder and CEO, Stephen Galanis. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. So you recently hit a million users and for many of them, this has been the perfect gift in the shelter in place. Talk to us about the activity that you've seen during quarantine. Well, first off, thank you for being a customer. We love that. Uh, we were able to put a smile on your face for Mother's Day and, and it seems that um, our theory of every cameo becoming a commercial for the next one worked out perfectly because now you know, you're know you getting one for your godson, which is extremely exciting to hear. That's how our flywheel works. So appreciate your business and glad that we could put a smile on everybody's face. Um, look, we've been very fortunate to be one of the businesses uh, that has seen some pretty significant tailwinds from this and it makes sense. Uh, every single athlete, actor, celebrity at their core is really, um, you know, a gig economy worker. Nobody calls them that ever. But, you know, the biggest athletes get paid per game. Uh, musicians get paid per show. Stand-up comedians get paid per act. Movie stars get paid per movie they do. So in a world where all production shut down, suddenly you have the whole creative class on earth, you know, all out of work at one time. And at Cameo, we're just really excited to be able to provide them meaningful income at a really tough time in their professional career, while also putting smiles on the face of their fans who really miss them because they can't watch them do what they love to do most, which is perform for them. Now, just some background, that video, that uh, that cameo that my husband got me for Mother's Day, I believe he had nothing at 8.30 in the morning, and Barb responded right away, and by 9.30, he had a great lift, and I just about died laughing. I just couldn't believe that she was speaking to me. Um, who is the most requested? What sort of trends are you seeing in terms of the kinds of celebrities and, and what they're asking for are popular? Yeah, uh, the thing that's very exciting is that we have such a diverse talent base. So at different points, um, you know, different people really are the hottest. So at the beginning of quarantine, uh, the ones that really exploded were the cast of the Tiger King. And it kind of made sense. Every single American was pretty much in the same position. They were sheltering in place. They were watching Netflix. And this viral show comes on and the characters became memes in pop, pop culture. And suddenly there was a ton of demand. There was more demand from the cast of the Tiger King than people like Snoop Dogg or Charlie Sheen, who have been some of the most famous people on earth for a while. Um, you know, Historically, the people who do best on Cameo are actually comedians pound for pound. So people love uh, you know, being joked, that the jokes that are provided or, or roasting their friends with the Cameo. Uh, they tend to do pretty well in addition to Hall of Fame athletes and script actors from really iconic scripted television shows like The Soup Nazi or Kevin, uh, Brian Baumgartner, who played Kevin in The Office. Those are some of the all-time uh, cult favorites on Cameo.
You also just launched Cameo Live, where you can actually book a 10-minute Zoom call with your favorite celebrities. These are significantly more expensive, like $15,000 for 10 minutes with the actor Jeremy Piven. Um, you know, talk to us about how much revenue you're expecting this to drive. I understand you're take, you take basically a 25% cut. What's the outlook for, for bookings and revenue this year? So first off, uh, I think relevant to your crowd, I'm a former market maker myself. So I was an options trader for five years, uh, traded in the CBOE. And, and, you know, for me, pricing is something that's always been really top of mind. And anytime you launch a new product, especially in a new category like ours, you never know uh, where you should price anybody. So we've always given the talent the ability to price themselves because we never want them to say this isn't worth uh, their time. And for the core Cameo product, right, we now have 40,000 different people on it. We have price points so talent can come on and, and almost use comps like, uh, like in real estate where they can see people that are similar statue, maybe teammates of theirs in a sports team or uh, a similar caliber musician in another band that has a similar demographic fan base. But when you're starting something like Cameo Live, a completely new product, you know, you just try to throw a bunch of different things out there and see what happens. Uh, we're really excited about this product because it's something that our customers and fans and talent have literally been banging on the table for. While we've long believed in asynchronous versus synchronous, we think that Zoom is certainly having a moment. Uh, right now, I'm coming to you live on Zoom. Uh, there's over 300 million uh, monthly active users on Zoom now compared to about, what, 10 million right before. So as a stockholder in Zoom, I'm really excited uh, to see how ubiquitous <laughs> it's come. But we really felt that you know those tailwinds for the underlying technology enabled us to try something uh, like Zoom calls, which if we had rolled those out to talent six months ago, they probably would have looked at us like we had three heads. That said, this isn't that big of a difference from doing a live and booking experience, which almost everybody has figured at some time point cameo will do so in many ways this is the much more scalable version of that and we've got really high hopes for uh okay. for this new product line all right well we'll be watching uh stephen galanis cameo co-founder and ceo thank you so much for joining us and, and and bringing me some joy on mother's day okay still ahead me. despite the pandemic the grocery chain albertson's is finally about to go public but didn't go as well as hoped that's next the ceo joining us this is bloomberg Albertsons faltering in its public trading debut after 14 years of private ownership. Shares of the American grocery train failing to take off after a shrunken IPO. Bloomberg caught up with the president and CEO, Vivek Shankaran, to discuss the IPO and his company's omni-channel approach during the crisis. We are so centered on the long term. As you know, our investors have been with us since 2006. Uh, have helped build this company and strengthen it. We have momentum in the business. And uh, we just felt the time was right. And when you have a long-term perspective, uh, we're not, we, while I look at the ticker, uh, I've been looking at it all day, I also recognize that we're building a company and strengthening this company to deliver value over many, many years. Talk to us about strengthening the company, building the company. There are many that might say, look, e-commerce needs to get better. Need, what about expansion plans in terms of ensuring that you maintain and grow that market share that you already have? Yeah, no question about that. Uh, but we came together as Albertsons and Safeway in 2015. And the first few years was focused on integration, putting common systems in place and such. And then we switched to transforming the company. And a transforming the company is all about putting new technologies. Um, and one of those is uh, our omni-channel solutions. And we go to the, we give the customer many choices. You can pick it up in our store, we deliver it with our own trucks, deliver it with third parties, et cetera. And we continue to expand it. We, we think there's plenty of headroom. It's important to recognize that it's all in the early innings for all of us in the industry. And there's so much learning, so much piloting going on. Um, and that, that's one element uh, of uh, strengthening the company. But there's also strengthening the company's day-to-day -day operations with technology. So we become more efficient, even in the stores where we do a lot of our business. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. You mentioned Safeway, obviously, uh, uh, the big combination there. But, I mean, under the Albertsons uh, umbrella, Vivek, I mean, you've got a lot of uh, different brands. Obviously, Albertsons, Safeway, Acme, Jewel Osco, which I grew up uh, on. I didn't even realize it was part of uh, Albertsons uh, now, a, a great uh, grocery store, by the way. Uh, I am curious, though, how seamless is it going to be for customers who want to use uh, an Albertson app or use some sort of uh, online delivery system from Albertsons if they're jumping maybe from city to city or from a uh, different uh, grocery brand to grocery brand? Remain, the first thing to recognize is these brands have been around for so long. Like you just said, Joe Losco is a household name in Chicago. Tom Thumb is a household name in Dallas. So we're proud of those banners and those banners mean a lot to people. And they all have this little nuance that's a little different uh, that's tailored for that uh, customer. When it comes to our e-commerce applications, our loyalty applications, you'll see the back end is the same. The front end is different. So you feel like you're on Tom Tom, but you're on the same infrastructure. Uh, when you move from uh, city to city, you carry your loyalty points. Now, and you carry, carry everything that you bought, all the data we carry with you. We are working on making those interfaces even better. It's a big part of our ad agenda. You know, that never stops. We're always trying to figure out how to make it easier for you to navigate and order with us. Uh, it's, a, it's a journey that never ends, and we keep, keep put more energy into it. Our analysis shows a debt load of almost $9 billion. Grocery stores notorious for just being a very low margin business. In the middle of a pandemic, how do you think about boosting margins and reducing that debt burden? Uh, our debt load is now 2.4 times our EBITDA, uh, which is a, is a good place to be. Our, our program is continuing to continue to reduce that from the cash flows um, that we get. It used to be much higher. It used to be more like four times EBITDA, and we brought that down significantly over the years. Uh, and so we're, we're not debt constrained. We're not capital constrained, let me put it that way. And we can take a very measured approach to pay that down and then get to the right balance of uh, debt and equity to fund the company. Albertson President and CEO Vivek Shane Carr in there. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. This is Bloomberg.